Well, hello and welcome to the Figgy Art Museum's Virtual Thursdays at the Figgy series. My name is Melissa Moore and I'm Director of Education at the Figgy and I'm very happy you could join us tonight. For the time being, we're hosting these virtual programs during most Thursdays, so please check out the Figgy's website for information on upcoming programs. We're able to offer these Thursday programs at no cost to you, thanks to the generous sponsorship provided by Chris and Mary Rayburn. For that, we're very grateful. Thank you, Chris and Mary. And while these programs are free to watch, I want to encourage you to consider becoming a Figgy member. You know, your support as a Figgy member is vital to the museum now more than ever, and it really helps us continue to fulfill our mission of bringing art and people together, even when we can't be together in person. So for those of you who are ready to visit the Figgy's galleries in person, we're open and we recommend that you check out our website, which has information on updated policies. Just a quick note, the cafe is temporarily closed, so if you're hoping to visit the museum and grab a bite to eat, definitely check the website first to make sure that the cafe will be open during your visit. For tonight's program, we welcome your questions, so please feel free to type those into the Q&A at any time during the program, and we'll respond to them as we can. At this time, it's my great pleasure to welcome our featured guest for tonight's program, Dr. Peter Hafner. Dr. Hafner is the Assistant Professor of Art History at Center College in Danville, Kentucky, where he teaches on the arts of Africa and the Black Atlantic. Before joining Center's faculty in 2019, he was a Smithsonian Institution Postdoctoral Fellow at the National Museum of African Art. His interdisciplinary arts-based research centers on the work of Haitian artists and the complex global cultural dynamics in which it is produced, exhibited, and circulated. He has worked extensively with artists, collectors, and curators in Haiti and in the US, and is currently serving on the advisory board for Haitian Art at a Digital Crossroads, an NEH supported digital humanities project aimed at increasing access and knowledge to the work of Haitian artists residing in international collections. He earned his PhD in Culture and Performance in 2017 from UCLA's Department of World Arts and Cultures Dance. He also holds a BA in art history from Bard College and has a professional background in arts administration. Dr. Hafner, welcome and thanks for joining us this evening. We're so glad to have you. Thank you, Melissa. Can you hear me? Great. Um, and welcome everybody. Um, I guess we have 40 participants. I can't see any of your faces, but I guess that's the idea and such is the world of the pandemic that we live in now. So I'm just gonna trust that you all are there and engaged and um, welcome. And I'm really happy that you decided to spend your Thursday evening to hear about this topic of which um, I have a lot to say, but only 30 minutes in which to say it. So, um, I hope I get to the major points and I'm able to distill them in a way that can um, begin a really good conversation uh, that we can do in the Q&A session. Um, but first off, I just want to thank Melissa, uh, Vanessa Sage, Joshua Johnson, and Andrew Wallace, and all of the Figgy staff and um, curatorial team, um, both for inviting me and for um, continuing to engage with the substantial collection of work by Haitian artists that's in um, their collection and has been for over 50 years. Um, the long It's a long collaborative history that they have with Haitian artists and I'm really happy to see that over the years and the transitions and uh, new teams and new buildings that it's something that they continue to engage with and build upon as I've been seeing as well, um, that will uh, include an image of some of the uh, new acquisitions. Um, but one of, um, I, I guess I'll be, I, I began with this particular uh, painting by Edouard Duval Carrier, who he himself has had a very long collaborative relationship with the Figgy. Um, and I believe his first solo show in the US uh, was here, but he's a Haitian American artist and, um, his, uh, th this particular work I, I first encountered in the Figgy itself back when it was you know, pre-COVID days. And I just love it because uh, generally speaking, I love works of art that, uh, especially works of Haitian art that feature um, collectors as the subject matter. It sort of kind of breaks the fifth wall in a lot of ways and re reveals 
uh, as what part of um, Melissa explained in my bio, what I'm most interested in in my research and my engagement with not only Haitian art, but art in general. And that is um, not just, you know, the work of art itself, but the entire constellation and ecosystem uh, in which art moves from one place to another, um, through which ideas and uh, money move, but importantly, people, human beings back and forth um, across different routes, uh, cross-cultural engagements that um, can yield very interesting, um, compelling results. And so the subject matter of this particular work is Walter Neiswanger, who is the gentleman who's responsible for um, beginning the Figgy's engagement with the work of Haitian artists all the way back in 1967. And um, not only do, is it sh does it show him in the courtyard of a spectacular gingerbread uh, property that's in Port-au-Prince, but it's 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 a bit mysterious. And I spent some time just really, I was just gonna begin with this work as a novelty, but the more I looked at it, the more um, I thought it really helped reveal what I wanted to engage with, with this talk. And that is, he's pointing at this koi pond and why he's doing that, I don't know. Uh, he has passed, I, if I, get Edouard de Valcarrier's ear at some point, I shall ask him why he chose to have him pointing at the koi pond. But um, water generally is an underlying theme to a lot of not only the work of Haitian artists um, and kind of histories and cosmology, especially of uh, uh, the Haitian practice of voodoo, but in terms of how we can conceptualize um, and answer the question of why is there so much work of Haitian artists in the Museum of Iowa? Um, water offers a, a sort of a, a, an underlying structure from which we can kind of understand some of these things. So I don't know, maybe he's friends with the Koi here and he just wants to introduce them to us as viewers. But I tend to think that he's bringing our attention to um, to water itself and to the ways in which things get transported across water. Um, yeah, in terms of Haiti's history itself, um, the transatlantic slave trade was um, a, the major factor in um, its history, uh, its contemporary history. Um, in terms of the United States, in terms of um, the uh, Figgy Museum itself in Davenport as a city, the Mississippi is a, a major, um, it, it's on the banks of the Mississippi, the museum. And I decided to, when I'm really preparing for this talk, I decided to go into uh, some of the Figgy's collection to see uh, some other works. What else has, has been collected? Because I've, I've, I've spent a lot of time looking at their Haitian collection and I've never really looked at uh, a lot in depth of what other works that they have. And I found two works that really kind of emphasize this idea of circuits and travel and moving and especially across water and especially as it relates to African descended peoples. So on the left is Thomas Hart Benton prints, uh, a print of um, depicting Huck Finn. You see Huck and Jim themselves on one of the rafts that they have. Um, on the right is, is a work from Jacob Lawrence's migration series. Um, both works are all about movement um, across long distances, what it means to move from a, a homeland to a, a strange place, um, and what it means to rub up against um, people of different cultural backgrounds, um, of very different uh, circumstances, socioeconomically and politically. And I found that these resonated with the Haitian collection a, a lot more than I thought. Their Haitian collection isn't just floating out there in the ether by itself as this sort of anomalous group of works, but it really does fit into a larger constellation of how we think about the work of Haitian artists and how we think about um, the, both the histories of the United States and the history of Haiti. Um, so that with the Haitian Masterworks show, there's a lot of 
um, there are a lot of really key pieces that really uh, emphasize this. So, okay, but going back to the basic question, why is there so much uh, Haitian art in Iowa? And one of the simpler oversimplified answers that I've come up with in the past, um, uh, which I think is actually rather reductive and I've kind of amended it a bit, but it's tourism. Tourism is what put Dr. Nice Wonger on a cruise ship in the Caribbean back in 1967. Uh, tourism is what um, set up his first encounter with the work of Haitian artists that he bought a, a, on that trip and then brought back to uh, the, the Davenport Art Museum as the figure was then known and showed to the board as a potential um, uh, area of acquisition for the museum. And it thus began a relationship um, with not only Haitian artists themselves, but the Centre d'Art, uh, the art center that was uh, established in Port-au-Prince um, uh, a, a generation earlier. Um, but before I really get into that, um, it's, it goes deeper than tourism. Tourism is perhaps the, 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 the superficial, most immediate reason for why um, the motivated nice wonders travel that sort of uh, grease the wheels of interaction um, between, between these two folks. But it goes back even, it goes back to the Sancho Dar, it goes back to before the founding of the Sancho Dar to, I think you could make the argument to the, uh, the, 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 the independence of Haiti, of Haiti itself. Um, by the time that Nice Wonger and the, uh, his, his fellow cohort of people who were part of the Figgy Museum, before they established a relationship with Francine Marat, who you sit there, uh, see there sitting, um, she was the director who took over after um, the former director, uh, Amer an American named DeWitt Peters. Um, he died and she became um, basically the figurehead of this arts institution that was both a, a gallery and um, a, a school and a gathering place and so many different roles that this institution had, but it was a very collaborative relationship that they had together. Um, and I guess I'll uh, talk a little bit more about the origins of the Sancho Dar um, briefly. So DeWitt Peters there in the photo on the right, um, he's at the head of the, this the group that includes most of the, the, the initial founding artists and he himself was an artist. Um, he often gets the most credit for the foundation of the institution, but it was really more of a collaborative affair and which he served a directorial role, but he is not, um, it didn't, it wasn't, it didn't begin and end with Peters. He was very much involved with all his Haitian partners as well. Um, there is the original site there on the left. Um, and, the, the history of the 1940s that goes back even farther, the whole reason that um, Americans had such a um, relationship with Haiti in this point in the 1940s, um, often as a result of the US Marine occupation of the country that lasted from 1915 to 1934. And in fact, as we see from um, one of the major sections of the Haitian Masterworks exhibition, um, history and it's the independence and some of the fiercer battles that have occurred that have occurred on Haitian soil um, really form the sense of a lot of the artists' history that form a part of the collection that form a part of the exhibition, the Haitian masterworks, and. This is one that I have returned to again and again, not only in my research but just in my own interests. Um, Philo Mayo Ben was one of the first of the, do we get into tricky, tricky uh, terminology territory here, but um, I'm going to use a lot of air quotes, so forgive me, but one of the first naive artists or untrained artists, um, uh, a lot of these terms are highly problematic now and contested, but he didn't have, uh, he had very little formal art training. He grew up in, um, in, in, in learned how to paint in the northern city of Cape Haitian, which is one of the more 
um, fertile regions historically for revolution, resistance against foreign occupying powers. And so it seems um, fitting that one of the mo more powerful works in the Figgy's collection has to deal with a series of skirmishes, battles, um, moments of resistance that occurred between Haitian guerrillas known as the Kakos and the Marines themselves. Um, for Oben and others, uh, other Haitians in the North and for Haitians more generally, um, this was a, a, a moment of pride. Even though they, uh, their leader Charlemagne Perrault was um, um, assassinated, um, even though the Kako rebellion was quelled, even though another 25 years or more of Marine occupation um, occurred in Haiti, this still was very much um, a really important moment. And it's one that, uh, oh, this is just one version, I've been able to identify at least three versions of this same work. Um, and it continues every time I look at it to be rather compelling and tell a story about, um, you know, Haiti is a very small country and it's, um, uh, you know, relative to the United States, for example, but it uh, has a no less a, a crucial origin story to, the, uh, to modern historical narratives than the United States. The first, um, uh, the first independent black country of, free, of formerly enslaved to free themselves of European colonialism, um, which is the subject of Jacques Chéry's uh, The Battle of Vertier, um, a work that depicts the, one of the turning points in the battles of the Haitian Revolution, um, in which uh, the, the French forces were finally repelled and which started the, um, which was the, uh, eventually led to the, 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 the first, uh, the de declaration of Haitian independence and the signing of the first constitution by uh, Jean-Jacques Dessalines. Um, so this is, uh, despite it being over 200 years ago, some of these events or a little bit nearer in terms of the Marine occupation, this is, um, these are ideas that every Haitian knows, just as you know every every child in the United States has 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 a sense of who George Washington or Thomas Jefferson was. These are equally as important and equally grand in terms of how these uh, these figures and these events figure into a sense of. Um, how many folks in Haiti see themselves and the pride that is taken in being able to throw back some of the uh, most powerful armies in the world and make themselves independent. Um, so I, that's, I, I guess, some of like some of the more historical, historically intertwined um, interactions, I guess I wanted to talk about, but um, Going back to our sort of like a, a contemporary time, especially when the times when um, Dr. Nicewanger uh, started building the collection of the Figgy, um, this particular work by Seneca Ben, who is the younger brother of Philome Oben, whose work we saw two slides ago, um, depicts uh, the, the iron market, the Maché de Fer, which is any tourist who visited Haiti in the 70s, and here I have to pause and say, address what many of you are maybe thinking, and that is tourists in Haiti. Uh, so many narratives about uh, you know, struggle and despondency and uh, political upheaval and all the other sensational headlines that we see that often accompany Haiti. Um, it, that wasn't necessarily the case in the 1970s. It was very much a uh, it was the second golden age of tourism, as uh, Brenda Plummer coined it. Uh, a very, um, a lot of celebrities would go down there. Um, even though this was uh, the height of of Baby Doctor Duvalier's uh, 
reign, it was very much a focus of his uh, uh, administration to encourage tourism, encourage uh, American travelers to come. Um, air, uh, airline and airfare uh, was becoming cheaper. Um, and, you know, being only a less than uh, hour and a half flight from Miami, it, there was a lot of uh, perhaps an economic, the potential for an economic panacea to attract foreigners. And one of the things, um, one of the major drawing points were uh, locations like the Iron Market, which the, if, if you go there today, it's incredibly busy. You can find literally almost anything you would you might need or want in amongst its many vendors, um, including art, including um, things that sometimes get denigratedly assigned or categorized as tourist art, which I think sells short um, the creative capabilities of many Haitian artists um, and doesn't really tell a full story. Um, but yet what gets determined to be tourist art is um, often those forms and the market for them are dictated by people like tourists or our, um, um, foreigners who are interested in the work of Haitian artists, um, but are, are attracted to sort of um, almost a, this raw quality that exists in the work. Um, and you, the more I've sort of brought into the focus of looking at works of art, like this cut metal piece by Marat Briere, which is in the show, um, the more I see that the same narratives that, are, that have been applied to a lot of Haitian artists are often applied to say folk artists or outsider or visionary or whatever term um, you're using in regards to that. Um, as these paragons of sort of this innate cultural or excuse me, innate expressive capability that is given form in by uh, uh, with materials that are available at hand that are easily accessible. The uh, often the, the cut metal pieces are either made from um, uh, oil drums that have been cut up and hammered out or often uh, Georges Liotteau, who is the first artist or one of the original artists to really work in this kind of material. He used uh, iron railroad spikes that he would then shape and form into crosses and other forms. Um, but it's, uh, there's a lot of, so, okay. So the, these are two slides that uh, from a previous uh, uh, talk that I gave regarding the figgy in the past, Walter Nicewanger examining one of these cut metal pieces. Uh, I believe this is in 1978. Um, and again, this, this collaborative cross travel that would go on. Um, uh, there's Francine Marat seated, former uh, director of the Centre d'Art. Um, Serge Jolimo, who, who the, the, the museum has many works of, and perhaps Damien Paul to the right. I believe that is Cleveland Chase, who is the former director. I can be corrected if somebody wants to do that, um, who's in the middle there. But um, an early show at the Figgy that was a, so, um, a, 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 a small group exhibition featuring cut metal works. And they would bring the artists uh, to the museum for the opening. Um, this is one of many photographs taken of just like the, the kind of collaborative atmosphere and interaction that occurred between the artists and the Figgy Museum itself. And I should take this opportunity to briefly state that the Figgy is not the only museum in, in Iowa that has such a substantial collection of Haitian uh, work of, works of Haitian artists. Um, two hours down the road at the Waterloo Center of the Arts as well has a very substantial collection. So. Um, and they were engaged with similar types of um, collaborate, collaborative exercises with the Centre d'Ars artists as well as others. That's a history that goes back some time. But one of the works that, um, this particular work from the show that really shows the influence of this, um, sort of this back and forth exchange of between patrons and artists as it, in the more contemporary history of Haitian art, our drapeau. Um, 
uh, these flags that um, they're originally were part were had a ceremonial usage um, in, in voodoo ceremonies and they would be unfurled and they would uh, 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 evoke particular loa um, or um, spirits that are associated with voodoo. Um, in this particular work by, um, says George Valery, by um, Don Balawedo. Um, this one is dedicated to him, for example. But once um, with the presence of expatriates who are interested in acquiring works uh, from Haitian artists that maybe um, would typify their experience and perhaps maybe they were looking for something that kind of edged on the exotic, the forms of uh, Drapo would become even more uh, elaborate, heavier being and sequences. Um, artists would not sign the works until um, I believe one particular collector um, encourage them to do so in order to prevent uh, fakery from going on, from competing workshops, for example. And so I said, we think this is George Valery. Um, and I don't mean to put uh, the, the, the figgy staff on the spot, but the initials there, um, CB, I wouldn't be terribly surprised if um, the attribution might actually be a flag maker named um, Clotaire Basile. So, um, just throwing that out there. I don't mean to put you all on the spot. But forms like this. But it, um, so there's often been sort of a, 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 a bifurcation between art flags, those for more of the tourist market, and um, ceremonial flags. But in my research before I became uh, uh, joined the faculty here at Center, I was working at, um, you know, I was doing a postdoctoral uh, uh, research fellowship at the National Museum of African Art in Washington, D.C., and there was a particular collector slash scholar slash uh, woman of all trades, uh, Marilyn Holberg, who had left her entire photo catalog. She had worked for over 40 years with Haitian artists, uh, trained as an anthropologist, but um, was also a photographer um, and collector and dealer herself. She had this particular photo from 1985 um, about of, um, a ceremony at a, um, a voodoo temple outside of Port-au-Prince that was a very popular attraction for um, visiting scholars, expatriates who were interested in voodoo but wanted to learn more about it. And the head priest there, Max Beauvoir, was the, um, who died only a couple of years ago. Um, he was uh, fluent in English, had uh, been he, he worked and was educated in the United States and he was very accommodating to visitors. But you, you know, some people might say like, oh, well, that's not the real thing. That's not authentic voodoo. And I, 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 I tend to not, uh, I don't like bifurcating um, things that you know, are supposedly authentic versus original because I think there's a lot of gray area in between. And I think this particular photo that Marilyn Holberg took of these uh, two voodoo initiates who are holding flags that are highly ornate, um, full of sequins, full of beads, might be more uh, easily attributable as quote art flags, and they're wonderful works of art themselves. Um, they are being used in a ceremonial context. Um, I, I don't think it's as rigid a dividing line between those two things. And I think to sort of dismiss some works of art as being for the tourist trade versus others um, doesn't necessarily tell the full story of the, the, the complexities of interactions that would happen between patrons and artists and you know, the, the different categories that exist therein. So I know I'm running sh shortly on time, so I'll try and get to this. So um, uh, Mirlan Constant is someone who, she, she's an artist who has taken the, uh, she's taken the medium of Drapo to gr uh, great heights since, uh, in, especially in the past 15 years. And she's one of, of, of the more um, elaborate uh, 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 Drapo artists that exist today. And I don't have the counterpoint to this work. Uh, th this is based off of another work by Edouard Duval Carrier, and you can see his name there uh, in, in um, sequence up top. 
and it's almost an exact mirror of Edouard's work. Um, I, I would love to hear the story. Was she commissioned to make this? Was um, Edouard, um, were they in contact with each other? Uh, just the, the narratives behind um, that the, the are involved in any artist patron relationship and that can yield such fantastic um, variants on themes and others work that I, I you know, I, I don't think this is like some cheap copy of Ed, Ed, Edward's work. And I don't think anyone would say that, but I, it, it shows the range of capabilities that many artists do have. Um, and I will end it with briefly just talking about um, this work that was acquired more recently and I was just really pleased to see it included in uh, the, the Haitian Masterworks exhibition because Didier William is a Haitian American artist who was um, doing some really incredible, fantastic things um, that uh, really play with the expectations that people have, especially um, collectors and patrons of what Haitian art should be, um, what forms it should take. Um, the fact that he doesn't translate or provide translations for his Creole titles really uh, speaks to a larger idea about cross-cultural translation and what it means to take um, to bring um, uh, bring the product of one culture into a new context. How what what gets lost in translation? What it should be translated translated and what is uh, better to be left on its own. Um, not every single work of art needs a, a, a clear reading about sort of like an iconography, this means this, et cetera. I think the ambiguity that he achieves in his work really um, and the amount of the, 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 the room for interpretation that it has, that I am glad that it gets to be in conversation with the other works in the exhibition. And I'm really just happy to see that the Figgy is continuing to um, engage and collaborate with the work of Haitian artists and can continue to um, make efforts to have them available for audiences. Um, so I hope that wasn't too rambling. I'm sure it was slightly disjunctured. Um, but again, this is the subject of my uh, PhD dissertation. So um, if you've got four hours, we can go over all the finer points, but I hope hopefully there I can clear some things up in the Q&A. So um, thank you for entertaining that. Thank you, Peter. And just based on some of the chatting that I've seen um, going on during your talk, I think there is an interest in a four hour talk. So if you are serious, we may just schedule that for another time, maybe break it up into different sections. Be happy to. Yeah, but thank you so much for sharing at this point. Um, we're going to turn it over to the informal Q&A. If you have a question that you have not entered yet, please feel free to do that into either the Q&A or the chat box that you'll find located at the bottom of your screen. And Peter, what do you want to keep the um, your screen shared oh, or yeah. did you want to? Go ahead and stop the share. All right, let me switch this view. All right. So we did have something come in here um, pretty early on in your presentation. A question that says, it has been noted by younger scholars, the dissatisfaction of prioritizing self-taught artists over their fellow academic painters. Where do you stand on this question? I think that part of the, um, that's a good, very good question. I think that part of the original, uh, some of the earlier writing on this topic and on the work of Haitian artists did tend to prioritize those of the more untrained, quote unquote, um, category. And I think that itself, there's a lot of reasons for that um, sort of, a, a, there's a, it's almost a primitivist reading where the fascination of like the, this idea of some, an artist being untainted by uh, contemporary styles, of, of having some sort of freedom of their own expression that, um, is valued in, in 
works that often fall into that category really took precedence. But as this, you know, I, I guess I'm of a more like contemporary generation of scholars to talk about this, that it's, it's, it's a very patronizing attitude to say the least. And it really um, marginalized and reduced the work of other artists who perhaps were more aware of um, exercises in abstraction, um, uh, tenets of surrealism, um, ideas in the, the more globalized Western art world that, um, that they were engaging with and they saw um, as, as fertile ground in which to make their artistic expression. So um, I think it's important to include a lot of artists of different backgrounds, but um, you know, but within a cultural context, of Haiti in order to get a, a clearer picture because um, works by artists like Philo Mayoban or Hector Hibolit, um, they are wonderful and they are fantastic and they are indeed powerful expressions, but there's a lot of work by other artists who were dismissed at the time for being derivative is one of the pejorative terms that's used. Um, when in fact, there is a lot of, um, that are, the, 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 there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot to un, unpack, to use that term. Um, and that the, uh, if we're approaching it from similar cultural context, and that is Haiti, I think there is a lot to reveal, not only about our own uh, in, in the West uh, preconceptions about the art of other people should be, but also the, the diversity and homogeneity or heterogeneity in Haitian culture itself. Um, there's no such one thing as Haitian art, capital H. There, there's the work of Haitian artists. And that I think um, is helpful towards addressing some of those issues. I hope that answers the question somewhat. Oh, that's great, thank you, Peter. And then um, why do you think it is so difficult for us to identify life dates, for instance, of artists who are seemingly well-known? Um, records aren't great. Um, birth certificates aren't necessarily um, de facto when a lot of uh, these artists were born. Um, so we don't, we just don't know. Um, their uh, infrastructural things that aid archives and record keeping um, have been very difficult to either maintain or create. Um, and I think that, that that is largely a lot of the reason for this. No, oh, that makes sense, thank you. And then do most of the art collectors only go to the center or do some go out to the other communities to seek art from some who are not well known yet? Oh, yes. Um, in the Centre d'Art, I, I, uh, I should note, um, today it, it's still in operation and doing great things. Um, but even back, uh, <laughs> so this goes back to the first question, um, soon after the artists who were, um, uh, uh, self-taught were prioritized by the Sancho Jar. A lot of the other artists who had been received more formal um, uh, higher educations in art, et cetera, um, they felt like they were being pigeonholed to um, act primitive. So they decided to go form their own, um, um, the, the Foyer de, 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 des Arts Plastiques um, <clears throat> in Port-au-Prince, um, uh, other factions in which they were a little bit more uh, uh, self-determined in terms of what they were making, et cetera. So even back in the 40s, the Sancho Dar often took a, um, a lot of people's attention who were visiting um, the country, but people were making art all over the place. Um, and it was by no, by no means centralized. And that continues to be the case today. Sancho Dar exists, but there are places throughout Haiti, um, in which people are making art as collectives, um, uh, people on their own by themselves, as part of ateliers and workshops. Um, 
you know, many of them are concentrated in, in, in Port-au-Prince, but it's all over the place. And collectors would go and visit them. Sometimes they would want to go find, you know, that untrained, untainted artist who's, you know, working by themselves in a field um, and, quote, discover them. So there was always this kind of sense of adventure that would accompany this, um, you know, however unrealistic some of those expectations might have been. So, yeah. Oh, thank you. And how is the movement to restore some of the mural from Trinity Cathedral progressing these days? Do you know? That's a, that's a good question. The last I know of it is that it was in storage as part of, um, I'm hoping I'm getting this right, but the University of Kiskeya has a, an art conservation program that was uh, spun off from the Smithsonian's uh, Haiti cultural recovery project after the earthquake. And they are training conservators in Haiti itself. Um, uh, 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 there has been, how do I put this? Uh, with the National Episcopal Church uh, in Haiti, there has been some um, uh, uh, stumbles recently in terms of their leadership, in terms of um, figuring out who's in charge and political issues that have prevented much um, progress of being made, not only in terms of the murals restoration and they, the parts that were restored are still in existence, but they need a cathedral, a new cathedral to be stored in, for example. And um, that needs to happen before um, the murals themselves get to be displayed again, but it's, uh, people are trying to figure out a way to um, surmount the challenges and get them back up. Oh, thank you for that. So we have a couple of questions that have come in that I think are um, great questions for me to follow up with our curatorial team on. So if you have submitted those and we haven't answered those, please know that I've taken note of them and I will, I will share those with our curatorial team and get you some answers. Um, at this point, Peter, is it okay if we do one more question and sure. then wrap up? All right. So we have a question here about why the Haitian art market is so depressed. There are contemporary artists uh, who hold auctions without sales. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I do. And um, I'm part of an organization called the Haitian Art Society, which is um, a, a lot of a wonderful group of collectors, enthusiasts, connoisseurs who um, have been helping me uh, uh, answer this question. Um, I'm on the board of directors as well, I should say, um, because I, I, I think it's fascinating as well. Um, why has the market been depressed? And there's a lot of reasons. Um, one is the issue of um, authenticating provenance. Um, there is a real problem with uh, forgeries um, people passing off, you know, forging, I'm not going to go into it. Uh, it, it it's self-explanatory. Um, there is, uh, uh and, and because of that, there used to be sales dedicated to Haitian art by Christie's, by Sotheby's, um, by Park Bernay. And uh, because of those authentication issues, they have largely stepped away from having exclusive sales towards, uh, the work of Haitian artists. Um, there are, uh, and that's been a large reason for it. Um, infrastructure in the country itself, uh, it's been tough to maintain the work of certain artists to some degree. Um, the, uh, with political upheavals and, um, and environmental problems and, um, the difficulty in traveling to Haiti and sometimes people's reticence to travel to the country, often that has, uh, if there's no one traveling, there's fewer people to buy. And that often becomes, um, uh, you, you need patrons in order to um, subsidize the work of artists. And there are people who are trying, to, who, who are dedicated, who are still doing it in Haiti itself. Um, but it's tough when you don't have clientele who are coming to the country and participating in the market like that. And we got that. I could do one more if you want to do it. Let's see here. Um, I do, let's see. 
Oh, it looks like um, if people want to check the chats, there are there are some um, there is some talking going on here. Uh, Peter, I don't see a question at this point that um, like that I won't take to our curatorial team. So if you're okay with it, maybe we can wrap up this part of the presentation and just invite our guests to continue chatting. We can also direct you who are um, who are watching to the Facebook page in case you'd like to revisit this program or if you're interested in watching a, a talk from our curators on the Haitian exhibition that happened on November 12th. That is also archived there. At this point, uh, Peter, I just want to thank you. You know, some of my fondest memories and, and you know, most interesting conversations came out of the most recent Haitian Art Society conference that took place in the Midwest. Those are very fond memories. And while we aren't sitting together on a porch at a reception, having a glass of wine with other uh, lovers of Haitian art, I know that they're here with us in the audience, even though we can't see them. And all, please know that we're raising a glass and saying thanks for joining us, Peter. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we will follow up with some of those questions that we haven't uh, addressed today. And I just wanna thank you all for joining. I know many of you are interested in seeing the Figgies exhibition, Haitian Masterworks. It's going to be on display at the museum through January 24th. I know many of you wanna see the exhibition in person when you can. So for those of you who plan to visit the museum, please make sure to check out our website. Again, for those up to date, um, policies and procedures for visiting to keep everyone safe. For those of you who are unable or not ready to visit the museum in person, we are putting together some virtual tour options. One of those is going to include going through the exhibition using both the Zoom like we are tonight and also the Figgies robot named Jeannie who can drive around the exhibition and share what it sees with you through Zoom. Some of you have attended prior programs and are aware of this opportunity and have already signed up. For those of you who are hearing about this for the first time, I would like, um, and if you would like to participate, I would love it if you could send me an email. So you have my email address and the link to join tonight's program, and you can also just reach out to the museum if that's easier. So again, I want to say thank you to Peter, and thank you all for joining us this evening. This is going to wrap up our virtual Thursdays of the Figgy program series for 2020. You know, we, we did a hard pivot in March when we went from live programming to, to virtual. We started getting these evening programs up again in July, and we've had a wonderful time with you for the past half of a year, really. We're going to take a break until January 21st, 2021, and then we're going to launch the new program season, which will start off virtual, and we'll get back in person as soon as we can. We look forward to seeing you at those future programs. And we hope you have a wonderful night. And once again, Peter, I just want to say thank you so much. And thank you, everybody. And happy Hanukkah. Yes. Everybody enjoy a wonderful and safe holiday season. Take care and we will see you next time. Good night.